Hi, welcome to our estate planning for special needs clients webinar. Before we get started, some housekeeping notes to share. My name is Phil Seibel and I'm a senior client advisor at WealthPoint and I'm also a board member of Central Arizona State Planning Council. First, uh, Firefox is the preferred uh, browser for your go-to meeting or go-to webinar. Uh, second, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us via the following methods. There's a questions box inside the GoToWebinar. Please ask your financial questions via the questions box on your, of your dashboard. If we don't get to all your questions during the webinar, we'll make sure to respond via email. There's also a chat box. If you use the chat box for other comments or questions, note that group chatting is not available. All chats are direct messages to our staff. And if you have any other further questions, please email us at webinars at kjzz.org. And for technical assistance, please go to the webinar support line at 888-259-8414. The panel discussion will last for just one hour. We do have some volunteers from the Central Arizona State Planning Council available to answer your questions now. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of, or I'm going to start with the introductions here so that everybody can kind of hear who they are, and then I'm going to ask each one of them to uh, speak about a little bit about their practice and why they got into doing what they do. I'm going to start on my left, uh, Ms. Banker. Uh, she graduated from the University of Denver College of Law in Colorado. She's been practicing and focusing on elder law since 2002 and is a certified probate mediator. In Denver, she practiced law for two years in estate planning and elder law prior to moving to Arizona. Ms. Banker was the 2010 president of the Arizona chapter of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. She is a member of the probate and trust section of the State Bar of Arizona and the Maricopa County Bar Association. Uh -huh. Yvette, thank you for coming here. Appreciate it. If you wouldn't mind, just take a couple minutes, talk about uh, some of the things, some of the reasons why you got into the area of practice that you're in. That would be fantastic. All right. Thank you, Phil, for having me. Um, basically, I um, am the managing partner and attorney in Banker Law Office, and um, I've been practicing law for since, like you indicated, since 2001. Um, my practice focuses on elder law, which is pretty much probate, estate planning, special needs planning, as well as some Medicaid and long-term care planning. Um, I got in my area because of I felt that seniors were really unrepresented and were taken advantage of very often by either family members or caregivers. And so I represent um, fiduciaries, I represent children as guardians and conservators, um, as trustees of special needs trusts and other, um, other kinds of trusts to really advocate for the seniors. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, next person to my left is Mike Dyer. Uh, Mike's major areas of practice include probate-related litigation, including wills, trusts, conservator conservatorships, uh, guardianships, elder law, mental health law, and other areas of law pertinent to such cases and special matters. He's also a certified private fiduciary, having been certified by the Certification Division of the Arizona Supreme Court. Uh, Mike, I'm going to leave it to you now. Explain a little bit about yourself and, and why you do what you do. Thanks, Phil. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. Uh, our practice that I uh, have is a small boutique office. There's about uh, 14 attorneys that practice in this area at Dyer, Bregman and Ferris. I've, I've been practicing this area for my entire legal career, so I've been practicing almost uh, 20 years now. And uh, primarily in this area, we do a lot of uh, estate planning, we do a lot of special needs planning, a lot of fiduciary representation, guardianship, conservatorship work. Uh, I was drawn to this area. Uh, my father practiced in this area for 40 years, and he and I had the, uh, the privilege of practicing together for about 13 years before he passed away. But uh, before then, I kind of grew up in the practice, really helping the elderly, helping uh, folks with special needs, and uh, visiting nursing homes and care facilities all along the way. So. Uh, really didn't have much choice, but I love uh, working in this area because I really feel that it's one of the last areas of law that you really get to help individuals. And so it's very rewarding. Wouldn't trade it for anything. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, moving to my right, uh, Roger Coventry. Uh, Roger is a partner and director of estate services for Childers and Burr. He was a collegiate wrestler at North Idaho College in Coeur d'Alene where he earned a an AA in psychology prior to joining the Army. Roger earned a BS in business management and information systems and an MBA from Arizona State University and a Juris Doctorate from Concord Law School. That's a lot of school. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> prior to joining Childersonburg, Roger was the Deputy Director of the Maricopa County Public Fiduciary. 
He has presented at local, state, and national level conferences on fiduciary related topics. He's been selected as an expert witness for fiduciary related litigation. Roger is the past president of the Arizona Fiduciary Association and currently serves as vice president on his board of directors. Thanks, Roger, for coming. And if you wouldn't mind taking a couple minutes of explaining how you got into the area of practice that you're in, that would be great. Well, like a lot of fiduciaries, I got into this uh, practice by accident. I started off with the Maricopa County Public Fiduciary's Office as its first financial exploitation investigator. And in that role, I investigated ale allegations of wrongdoing, typically family members, but others uh, exploiting elder and vulnerable adults. And from there, I, I joined Childers and Berg in private practice in 2009 um, and became a partner with them. They're a private fiduciary firm. They handle all various types of fiduciary roles, including trusts and special needs trusts work. Um, been there for, well, since 2009. Got about 15 years as a licensed fiduciary. Uh, enjoy the practice, it's challenging, and happy to be a part of the community. That's great, thank you. And then the final, our final panel member on my right is Debbie Schultz. Uh, she's the Vice President and Senior Trust Account Manager at Reliance Trust Company of Delaware, operating in Phoenix. Debbie, Schul <laughs> Debbie has over two decades of experience in estate planning and trust administration. She provides personal trust administration services for clients of the Reliance Trust Company of Delaware, as well as maintaining a long-term uh, relationship with her clients, financial advisors, helping to ensure successful collaboration and coordination of services. Debbie, thank you as well for being here. And, um, I'm going to ask the same question I've been asking everybody. How did you get into it, and, and why, are, why are you doing this? Great. Thank you, Phil, for having me. As you said, I work for Reliance Trust Company of Delaware as a senior trust officer, and my primary, my primary focus is on the special needs administration. How I got into it was that I um, formerly was a paralegal and worked with several attorneys in the area who specialize in elder law and um, special needs planning and just wanted the opportunity to have more hands-on experience with the clients and to have more of the um, interaction with them and it, it's just a rewarding area to be in. Um, my heart is with special needs children and adults and so that's that's my primary focus for the firm. Hmm. That's great, thank you. Oh. Um, as you can tell, everybody here has a, a, a passion toward helping um, and I know that um, sometimes it doesn't feel that way, but I, I, what my goal is, is for all of our listeners here today, uh, continue to hear that passion, but then continue to start to hear things of things they can do to protect themselves and their family members. Um, and potentially knowing that these people are here as a path to getting toward that. I think that would be great. I think a lot of people don't quite get the full scope of services that are available to them. Um, and I think the first question I'm gonna start is gonna be very broad in general. Uh, from the perspective of, and I'm going to start with Yvette and we're going to work our way across, but from your perspective, getting this process started, you know, if you're a family member and you, you have either, it, and you, you can choose if you want to start with special needs or you want to start with elder, it's up to you, but you're faced with one of those scenarios or it's coming down the road, what should a family look to to get started with this process to start that protection method? Well. We always recommend planning um, instead of being in crisis mode and then coming to an attorney at that point. So the more you plan ahead of time, the better. Um, and that I think every single person should have a will and at a minimum a health care power of attorney and a financial power of attorney. Um, those are you know, really important documents to protect yourself and your family. Um, by having those estate planning documents later on, you can avoid guardianships and conservatorships for um, having be filed on your behalf. Um, if you have a will, you can do special needs planning in that will or trust. Um, you can do a testamentary special needs trust. Um, so really a lot of times we see a lot of different scenarios from parents who say, I have a disabled child who's about to turn 18, what do I do? And we would do a guardianship over that individual. And then we'd also indicate to them that, you know, you really need to plan for when you pass. Because when you pass, if you leave assets to that individual, they are going to lose public, excuse me, public benefits that they may be on, such as Social Security, um, Medicaid, or Altex here in Arizona. Um, so it's really important to plan ahead. 
um, going to an attorney obviously that practices and specializes in special needs planning and elder law is ideal. Um, you know, there are some self-help um, websites on the Maricopa County um, Clerk of the Courts, that some, some simple forms on guardianships and conservatorships, but it's always better to go and make sure you see a licensed attorney. You mentioned in, in that answer, thank you very much, that you know a, a child turning 18 is setting up a guardianship. Would you mind explaining to the listeners what that what that means and what does sure. what is that? Sure. An individual who is disabled, maybe they have autism or they had some kind of traumatic brain injury or any other kind of diagnosis that really enables them not to be able to um, make decisions for themselves. They're unable to um, speak to doctors and really advocate for themselves. Parents usually will um, apply to be, become their guardian. What that means is that you're going to court to have legal authority to act for them um, when they turn 18 years of age. Obviously a parent can do any medical um, situations for them while they're under 18, but as soon as they turn 18, they're an adult. And so if they can't advocate for themselves and talk to doctors and, and maybe not even know what medications they're taking, um, we see a lot of kids with autism, we see a lot of kids who were maybe even in car accidents. Um, so it's really important to file a guardianship, become their guardian, and um, you can even plan in your own will on who should be a successor guardian also. So those are just important things to think about as your child turns 18 and you can start planning that six months before they even turn 18. And then, Mike, I'm going to pose this question to you, but again, if anybody has any comments, please feel free to add to that at this point. But, you know, some people have heard of a testamentary special needs trust. Would you mind expanding on that and kind of what is that? Sure. So uh, there are, as you've indicated, Phil, several different types of trusts. and. Testamentary special needs trust is a special needs trust that arises within the will uh, of a decedent. Uh, many times, when you add testamentary, that you know dictates when the when the actual trust becomes effective, which would be upon the death of the person that created the will. So that's opposed to a living trust, and many times folks are a little bit more familiar with a living trust because you see so many seminars and. They're very popular vehicles to avoid probate. Uh, and you know a lot of uh, nationally syndicated financial advisors have suggested that everybody requires a, a living trust. And so you're familiar with living trusts and oftentimes, especially when you have a, a, a handicapped child, a special needs child, and you've gone to a planner to uh, make sure, as Debbie has said, that you plan early. So when a special needs trust, uh, someone has created a living trust, they pass away, and instead of it being funded through a will, it's funded through a living trust. So it's not a testamentary trust that's created through a will, it's a living trust uh, extension. So, um, you know, there's uh, many different manners in which uh, I know many families decide that they want to do some gifting and establish a special needs trust immediately for uh, family members. Really, this, uh, this is a definitely an area, if I could just hearken on to what Debbie says, which is planning on the front side uh, really benefits families tremendously in this area. And waiting and avoiding crisis mode uh, is uh, a definite need in this area. And a lot, a lot of benefits can run to not just the special needs beneficiary, but to the family as a whole, uh, because um, uh, you can really carry out some wishes of, of the family as to how they can, how the special needs beneficiary uh, can be uh, cared for uh, in the future, but also with other family members. So planning is definitely important. You mentioned something about the, the wishes being carried forward, and that's going to transition to my right now. As far as <laughs> when do you guys see it as as a, as an ideal? transition from the, the plan being created to the transition to your side of being carried forward. How does that look? What's what's ideal for you? And so for these listeners, they understand like, okay, I've done that. Great. Now when do I start to think about engaging that next line? Well, typically there's a whole team of professionals involved in, as um, Mike and has mentioned, the earlier the better. So Typically, we have an attorney, maybe a care plan manager, a professional trustee, 
And so if we have a care plan in place, we know what the needs of the beneficiary are, and so we can start looking in terms of what type of distributions are going to be required of the beneficiary, what type of medical care is going to be required, and we can just uh, develop a plan to ensure that the trust is there for the, um, you know, the entire lifetime of the beneficiary and at the same time maybe making sure that beneficiaries' needs are met. Roger, from, from your perspective, as far as like, you know, the plan is set up and, and, and potentially third-party gifting into this plan, you know, what, how does that look and what happens if that scenario, it, it could be a good thing for a, for a beneficiary, but is there something that families need to be paying attention to in that area? Sure. Um, first of all, they, they should know that a third-party gift to a special needs trust is permissible, uh, but it has to be done in such a way that it doesn't create a problem for the trust. So it either has to be set up under its own terms for special needs or under the terms of the trust. It, it can't just be a gift of cash that then becomes a countable resource and held against the, uh, the beneficiary. So it can be done, it just has to be done carefully. Thoughtfully. And is that incorporate back to the uh, attorney and, and is usually everybody involved in that process at they this point? probably should be. Um, okay. and, and, you know, they might not know when the special needs trust is being established that there is a third party out there who's going to make a gift. It could be decades down the road. Mm -hmm. um, it could be from another estate, for example. That beneficiary might be the beneficiary of someone else's estate. Uh, it's not necessarily a gift, but where does that money go if they're the beneficiary of someone else's estate? this could be the vehicle for it, bringing it into the special needs trust. And, and Debbie, I hate, I hate to, but to go with this route, but sometimes the visualization of, would you mind giving a story of something where things went really, really well? You know, like this was set up, this trust was set up, and, and the family responded well. Do you, do you have a case that in your, off the top of your head that, you know, where it went well, because the back side of my head is where has it gone forward? Um, Okay, so a recent case, we were brought in at the last minute because the trustee that was um, on the board to be selected decided that they were uncomfortable administering a special needs trust, and so we were referred um, to the business, and we jumped on board and um, attended the hearing with the beneficiary's father. Uh, we were successful in uh, eliminating the need for court accounting requirements for this individual to save costs for the trust. Uh, we just helped allevi alleviate the, the anxiety he had. Uh, he has a five-year-old daughter that was injured in a car accident and has suffered severe brain injury and all of a sudden has this large settlement that he can't, you know, wrap his head around as to how to manage these funds and what needs are, uh, you know, what type of needs are uh, recommended for his daughter. And so we were able to kind of step in and point him in the right direction and help. Uh, at the initial stages, there's usually large um, purchases that are planned, uh, such as do we do we purchase a home? Do we build a home? Do we modify the existing home? Um, now you have an individual that requires a handicapped vehicle and um, look to you know, what type of other treatment and therapies the beneficiary needs. So it went well that we, we were able to step in and make a seamless transition and, and just help the anxiety of the family. Mm -hmm. That's sad but great at the same time. Yes. Um, here. Now, in that process, what if they hadn't done a few things, where, where could it have gone wrong? Or where, what, do, what do you see that, like, man, this went really well, but man, if they had done this, unfortunately, this could have taken this thing down a path that would have been a bad. Or what have you seen where people are like, you should have done this or this? Well, a lot of times uh, we kind of step in after the fact. Maybe an individual is appointed as the initial trustee and they become overwhelmed and um, the record keeping is burdensome and they're just frustrated with the process. 
Uh, it may be a family member that's been asked to serve as trustee and it's causing friction in the family. And so we're asked to step in to help, um, you know, really have the family become a family unit again mm -hmm. and to kind of promote a sense of, you know, to step in and allow them to kind of have a, that sense of harmony back that they didn't have before. But a lot of times, uh, maybe distributions are made that aren't appropriate because they're not seeking advice of professionals. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they, that can impact the benefits that they're receiving. Thanks. Um, we mentioned like the, the benefits that they all, this in this scenario there there was a lump sum that, coming from a judgment, um, but as far as like the the social benefits that are there, you know, and I'm going to kind of throw this out to the panel here for this the social, how does that affect, you know, Medicaid or or whatever the situation is? How does how does something like that affect potential social benefits that are there and available for a family member? Um, I, I'm thinking of unfortunately of a coworker of mine who has. A daughter who's special needs, and they, and they, and they, it's, it's a lot of work on their part, um, you know, to to get to those benefits, and there's a lot of fighting that they've had to do through the years to get to that. Would you guys mind speaking to that a little bit? Um, mm -hmm. The help you could provide. Sure. Um, so at least a, a small portion of it. If I didn't confuse everybody completely the last time that I was speaking, referring to a vet as Debbie, um, <laughs> hopefully I've cleared that up. So. Uh, but uh, I think both Yvette and I work very closely with family members to make sure, especially at the onset, because that, uh, to set families in motion to make sure that governmental benefits, I mean, that is the topic and that's always the hot piece about setting up special needs trusts is making sure that the governmental benefits that the beneficiary is receiving are not negatively impacted. So it is important. Uh, because families do, especially, you know, the hypothetical or the, the example that uh, Debbie was speaking of where you have a child that's injured and, you know, for many years they're waiting for and striving to receive uh, a personal injury outcome or settlement. And so they've had nothing but governmental benefits to live on and to help them make it through on a regular basis. And uh, as we and many times find out those those outcomes in those personal injury suits aren't always uh, sufficient to pay for the care and really uh, many of the things that that child or injured party is going to require for the rest of their life. So you've got to package and you've got to make sure that the governmental benefits stay intact and how you accomplish that is to make sure number one that the trust is properly worded if you're going to put it in that vehicle um, and making sure that you're working with qualified and individuals that are experienced in this area. There are several specific requirements for a special needs trust uh, depending upon the source of the funds. One and the example that uh, uh, Debbie had indicated is a first party trust. It means the funds were the child's or the individual's. Um, the recovery from the particular personal injury award was their own. A third party is more like what Roger was referring to where it's an inheritance. It's coming from grandma and grandpa or uh, another family member for the benefit of the special needs. And there are different requirements that um, the practitioner that you're working with needs to be aware of. If there's an area that I see most often an error is made is that a family will go to maybe someone who practices in this area that maybe just does a lot of estate planning but doesn't do a lot of public benefits uh, or special needs planning and they'll you know they'll feel comfortable creating a third party special needs trust but not necessarily a first party trust and so that's uh, a little bit technical i know they want to keep us uh, a little bit general and applicable to all but that really is one of the areas especially when you're talking about the social side of keeping benefits intact more benefits are lost because of family members and practitioners and professionals in an area not recognizing the difference uh, between the source of the funds. And once you start down the right road, it definitely helps you uh, make sure that the benefits stay intact. And um, on that topic, the main difference is 
who the ultimate beneficiary of the trust is. Uh, and uh, I'll let Yvette I was just going to more about that. Yeah, I was just going to say, Phil, it's really important to understand, though, that special needs trusts are for any disabled individual under 65. I know we've talked a lot about children, but it's mm -hmm. it's not just for children. It's for any disabled individual under 65 years of age. So I think that's important to you, you, understand. I'm going to look to Rogers here. It, you know, we've talked a little bit about the the uh, government benefits, but like high level, like what what can a special needs trust do pay for without affecting those benefits and that's that's probably the ultimate question uh, a lot of times for the person who's administering it so I think what I'd like to do is start off by saying you know what it, what it can do and can pay for is a very broad field and I'll kind of cover some of the examples but to start off with it's probably better just to focus on get people focused on what you can't pay for yeah. because that's where you get in trouble that's where you end up losing some benefits or at least suspending benefits. So the, the special needs trust should never give the beneficiary cash or cash equivalents or pay for food or shelter. They're pretty broad categories, but if you stay away from that, you're going to be fine. There are exceptions. There's a lot of rules and there are exceptions to the rules, so that's where you need to go to a, a person who really knows what they're doing. We seek legal advice regularly when we have a, a gray area that we want to potentially make a distribution but we're not sure if that's going to impact benefits we we seek legal advice and and Roger from that standpoint when you say food and shelter it's important for the listeners to recognize the reason for that is because when you're when you're trying to insulate and keep governmental benefits in place that's specifically what the government is intending on providing for individuals right so if you have a special needs trust they don't want distributions to <coughs> impact what the government is providing, food and shelter through either Social Security benefits or all tax benefits or access or Section 8 or otherwise. So it, it lends reason to uh, uh, understand why those are the two hot for sure areas that the government wants uh, distributions not to be made in. So now those are the lines you can't go <laughs> outside of, but, but, but there are a lot of options. And, and I'll give you some examples, clothing, Recreational equipment, vehicles, television, musical instruments, uh, stereo systems, purchase of a home um, with rent paid by the occupants. A good way to look at it is just to say what's going to supplement the disabled individual's needs. Sometimes we call it a supplemental care trust because that really is what it is. It's to supplement the needs. So it's not to pay for the needs like food and shelter. like. Mike indicated what governmental benefits should be paying for if you're on governmental benefits, then it's to supplement. What maybe, maybe you're into you know, nutrition and homopathy and stuff like that, or acupuncture, things like that. For a disabled individual, those are not paid by public benefits. And those are really important things that may help them in their treatment. Um, you know, so those are really good things to think about, what the, why this trust is so important. The one important. point I want to make is when you do pay for things that are allowed, you need to pay the provider or the service provider or pay for it directly and, and not cash to the beneficiary. Go pay for this yourself. <laughs> uh, that's almost never allowed. And if it, you know, so stay away from that. <laughs> I, I was just going to chime in if that's exactly, I mean, the purpose is to enhance the beneficiary's life and to provide them with uh, whatever therapy or treatment or special programs make their lives better. That's good to know. Um, qualifying for the government bene benefits, what's, do you, do you mind just speaking that for a couple of minutes, like what that process is like? Uh, I, I think, you know, it can be, I would imagine, um, frustrating. Um, I bet. Um, but speak to that for just a couple of minutes, if you would mind. Sure, I mean, government benefits are, specifically for needs-based people. Um, one of the it's taxpayers' dollars, basically, um, let's start with Medicaid for long-term care for disabled individuals who are older who need long-term care. Let's say they need skilled facility or they need assisted living um, or something like that. And it's a, for, for ease of today's topic, let's just say they're single. So for Medicaid and Altex in Arizona, you can only have $2,000 in assets. Um, there are some exclusions that do not count as an asset, such as a house and a, and a car. 
Um, there's some burial policies and things like that, but the general rule is that, that you can't have more than $2,000. So obviously $2,000 is a very small amount. They also look at income. Um, for all techs, you can only have $21.99 in 2016 um, to qualify for income. Um, there's basically three tests, a medical, a resource, and an income test. And so those are the income and the resource. And then you have to pass the medical indicating that you do need long-term care. Um, for Social Security disability, there's always a very big um, you know, question into listeners who don't understand the difference between Social Security disability and SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income. SSD, or Social Security Disability, is based on your qualifying quarters of what you worked for. So let's say you, you were working and now you're disabled for one reason or another because you got into a car accident. But if you worked enough qualifying quarters, you will qualify for Social Security Disability. That is not a needs-based program, it's an entitlement because you paid into Social Security by working. Supplemental so Supplemental security income is the exact opposite. It's a needs-based um, where you'll get some income depending on um, other criteria, which um, the amount for 2016, I believe, is about $750, $736. You will never get more than $736. But at least it's, again, to supplement any other benefits. There's food stamps. Um, you know, a lot of people need food stamps. There's um, access medical care, kids care. I mean, there's so many different kinds of programs out there. There's programs through DDD and um, developmental disability um, and DES. So it really depends on how what the person's it? needs are, um, you know, how old they are, and I mean, just a variety of criteria. But it's all dealing with a government agency, and you must stay after them. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's very difficult to get people qualified for for benefits, and that's yeah. why once you're on it you don't want to lose them. And that's why if you're going to get inheritance or any kind of money, you want to make sure you have it in a special needs trust so you don't lose those benefits that you worked so hard to obtain. Well, to follow up on how difficult it is, you know, we, our, our firm has a lot of folks who are on public benefits and we have gone through the process of applying and following up and it is getting so challenging with the regulations and the red tape that even for our firm, it's, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's almost impossible for a lay person, family member, to try to do this, you know, they get discouraged. And we've had people come to us mainly because they can't get through the red tape. You know, they can't stay on the phone for four hours waiting on hold. And so there are law firms out there now that specialize in getting public benefits for folks. It's that challenging. And so if, if you're a family member and you're having a hard time, don't, don't feel like that you're the only one. It's, it's really becoming challenging. Yeah, one other... Uh benefit program and uh, Yvette really did a very nice job of, of discussing uh, the majority of the benefits. I would just add that the Veterans Administration oftentimes I know uh, her firm works uh, very closely and does a lot of the benefits planning is does hours on veterans and recognizing that there's aid and attendance in addition to uh, you know service connected disability and, and uh, veterans benefits themselves are very full and it's important and in fact the state requires before you pursue all tax benefits that you have the family has pursued any VA benefits that an individual would be entitled to receive because obviously uh, the state likes the contribution of federal dollars if it can get them so um, uh, lots of benefits out there a lot of different requirements uh, it does take some time to uh, get through them and having the assistance of someone help, helping you, it, you know, is always um, preferred. I can tell you that some of, uh, uh, and Yvette uh, had suggested to keep it a little bit on point, you know, some of the qualification uh, factors for a single individual, but probably some of the saddest cases for us when we help uh, folks get on a plan is, is them not taking advantage of that really early planning, where you have a couple, you have mom and dad, and uh, you know, uh, normally it's the dad because they're older, starting to have some dementia, starting to really have some challenges with being able to make decisions, and is going to have to get placed in a care facility. Gets placed, and the wife or the mom just continues to pay that monthly amount to the care facility, uh, almost to the point of being uh, completely exhausting their finances. And had she sat down with someone that could navigate and help them do some pre-planning. You know, the government doesn't require impo impoverishment for the spouse, 
uh, as long as you recognize what the rules are and can assist folks through them. And that's some of the hardest uh, information to find on websites, on governmental websites, and really out in the community because so much of the community uh, has those numbers in their head. Well, you can only have $2,000, that's it, and you don't qualify when for a couple. Those figures really uh, are different. Mm -hmm. um, some of the listeners may, may have, may not, with the, the ABLE Act, um, and I think I'm going to kind of throw this out to the panel here because I think this is something you guys have all kind of can touch on. Um, Yvette, I'm going to start here, and maybe we'll just work across sure. if that's okay. Sure. Would you mind, wh what is it? <laughs> what, what, how does that help? What, what does right. it do? You know. Right. Well, President Obama um, signed it um, in 2015, and now it's finally coming to the states and passing in the, in the state house and senate. So the ABLE Act is basically achieving a better life experience. So it's for disabled individuals. It's very similar and is supposed to be similar to a 529 plan. Um, as everyone knows, a 529 plan is so that um, parents usually and maybe other family members can contribute money to this plan and have um, their child or individual or niece, nephew, whatever, go to school and use that money for school. But for people with disabilities, that may not be obviously um, able for them to achieve. So um, this is really like an account where people can put money into. Um, it has to be a parent or um, guardian or agent under power of attorney. Um, they'll put monies into an account and it's um, tax free and they'll use it for training, education, um, things that a disabled individual would need which is a little different than just a normal individual going to school. Um, so it's a really good um, it's something different, finally, um, I think, for disabled individuals, and um, it doesn't affect public benefits up to about $100,000. It won't affect SSI. Um, so, I mean, this is just new to Arizona and new to all of us as practitioners and just doing in this field, and it'll be really exciting to incorporate it, I think, into planning. Um, Mike, any, any thoughts that your experiences, I guess, maybe so far? It's, it's new. Yeah, you no experiences that. yet. I okay. know that uh, the first state to uh, adopt the necessary legislation and start uh, accounts is Ohio. So, uh, and in fact, the federal government uh, changed a little bit of the rules, similar to the 529 plan, allowing individuals to establish a ABLE account in a different state is not prohibited. So. Uh, I guess, you know, similar to Arizona, Arizona's just made its way through, uh, so they've adopted the legislation. I know that that's gone through, but now the infrastructure at the banks and the financial institutions now need to catch up. So it's taking a little while, but uh, if folks are really interested and want to get an account started, uh, it's just a ticket to Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, you're from your firm's perspective of seeing this come across, what, what were your thoughts? Um, well, I, I think it's just another tool in the planner's tool chest, you know, so to speak, yeah. to not only allow the, the parents and the beneficiary themselves to establish monies or resources for the trust, but other people. You know, this kind of speaks to the idea that other third parties can help fund their special needs. So it's just one more tool that the professionals have. And Arizona will probably be very close behind. You know, Arizona tends to be at the forefront of the elder law uh, around the, state of the United States. Debbie, any thoughts from, from Reliance Trust perspective? I know you guys have a, you know, kind of a broad reach across the country. Uh, we do, and it is such a new concept, but correct me if I'm wrong, the legal counsel here, I think it might actually help us corporate trustees because those accounts can be used to have cash available to the beneficiaries. As Roger spoke to, uh, it, it's the worst thing you can do is put cash in the hand of a beneficiary that's on receiving public benefits. So those type of accounts, if I understand how they work, they can utilize those for the cash needs that we would not otherwise be able to put cash into their hands for. Is that a correct statement? Yeah, that, yeah. that is. And, uh, you know, with the, within the limits that they talk about, right, yeah. there's a certain contribution limit on an on a annual basis. Mm -hmm. uh, as I, I think uh, you're right on as far as giving flexibility. Another mm -hmm. area, I think, and this is a challenge 
for all the professionals at this table as well in the community is that you know when you would have we, we've talked about and it's been used as an example you know a minor who might be getting uh, you know a large recovery from a catastrophic injury but uh, the challenge that I've been faced with over the many years is a scenario when it's not a large recovery and you have a modest recovery of, uh, you know, ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars is going to knock them off of benefits, and they're almost forced to spend it on things right away right. or lose benefits. And I really think, it, at least in our office, it's all about quality of life planning, right? It's uh, and this able account gives folks that um, may not be able to have sufficient, you know, large amounts of monies from a loss to still be able to. Um, have a, a little bit of a reserve to improve their quality of life. That's where I think you're going to see a, a tremendous benefit of the ABLE accounts. Any other comments? Um, I think we spend a lot of time on special needs planning and it's kind of, it, it feel like sometimes it's because of an event or, or the way somebody was unfortunately born. Um, but elder planning let's put it that way I mean that's something when should family start because the conversations that probably all of us are starting to experience where is you have a generation that just got done taking care of their parents and now they're starting to look at this and going I don't want to put my kids through this when is that time that they should start to engage and start to really look at that how they want this process to go and then how do they get started um, they should start now. <laughs> um, I really, I think I said this in the beginning. I really believe at a minimum everyone needs um, some kind of estate plan. If that's just powers of attorney for health care and one for financial, then at a minimum that's what you need. If um, you have children and something were to happen to you, with, if you don't have a will, you have no named legal guardian now. And maybe you don't want it to be the brother, and the brother and now the sister are going to fight. So it's very important if anybody has children, you know, minor children especially, to do a will or a trust and name who you want to be that person's legal guardian if something were to happen to both the mom and the dad of those, those children. And your, you know, your wishes will be honored um, by the court very easily. Um, if you don't put that into place, then you're looking at being in the juvenile court and trying to find a legal guardian for these minor children who just lost both parents. Um, so. So that's on that side. I mean, I would say that um, a lot of my clients are probably in their 40s, 40s and 50s. You know, they're finally coming to me going, oh yeah, we have a house now, we have IRAs, and you know, what should we do? So at a minimum, I always like to do powers of attorney, a will or a trust. Um, I don't know if we want to talk about the differences between wills and trusts, but um, you know, there are significant differences. Um, you know, a will does not av avoid probate and a trust does. Um, a lot of people don't know who to name as agents under powers of attorney and agents and personal representatives under wills and successor trustees. So I think that's where, you know, Roger and, and um, see, now I forgot her name, <laughs> and Debbie um, come in. I mean, I sit down with my clients and say, listen, if you don't trust a family member, then let's think of a private fiduciary or let's think of a financial organization, a bank that, you know, specializes in in serving as trustees and personal representatives or agents under powers of attorney. Um, so I think you know going to an estate planning attorney or elder law attorney is very important on the onset to avoid some of that. If you don't, I mean, my, clients come to me in crisis mode all the time. I had one today. Um, someone is just in um, the hospital and now they have no powers of attorney and we're filing an emergency um, petition for guardianship. So that means we're going to go to court and we're going to have this proceeding and you know there's going to be legal expenses involved and time and energy and now you're being overlooked by the courts and there's rules you have to follow and so planning is very important mm -hmm. as early as possible yeah. I would say is the better mode even if you know you're in crisis mode there's still a lot of things that can be done and to add to what if that has said with regard to expenses as a practitioner and the person who ends up administering these estates one of the things that occurred to me is a lot of times folks don't recognize that they're vulnerable to having a car accident. You know, you may be young and healthy and life is great, but in an instant, you could be facing a totally different set of circumstances. 
And you've got to think this through. Okay, if something were to happen to me or my spouse, then what? A lot of times we, we now have a lot of mixed families. And mixed families tend not to get along very well, especially when it comes to the administration of an estate or trust for a decedent. And, and so that's where our firm ends up getting involved. We see where they, they try to do the best they could with what they had, you know, have this person administer my estate. The family start to fight, we get involved, and the cost actually is almost exponential as to what they would have spent if they had just kind of give a little more thought as to how is this really going to work in the real world and what are our options. A lot of folks had never heard of a private fiduciary firm and so that's not really an option for them because they don't know. But when they go to an attorney early and the attorney can say, well, what's your family dynamic? How's this going to work? Have you considered a private fiduciary as an option? And, and even if they start with their friends or family, it's always a good idea, in my opinion, to name a tertiary or even a, a fourth alternative, just in case those first two don't work out for whatever reason. They're, they're aged, they're in, incapacitated themselves, they're not interested, they live in a different state now. So there's a lot of things to consider. Yeah. From a, uh, I guess from a how early is too early, uh, I, I don't, I think that there are so many resources and I know especially you know looking back you're first married or a young individual that's out of college or otherwise sure it's disposable income costs but there are so many resources available and I always tell folks you know sure you know coming to a professional that does this for a living um, it can be expensive it doesn't have to be but there are resources through computer programs I mean you see them advertised on TV paralegal I mean it and I don't sure those are all competitors to what we do but I can tell you my experience has been something's better than nothing especially when you're in the area of the things that Yvette was talking about in the example she gave with someone in the hospital with no powers of attorney you know I have a lot of folks that will call and say well I need a will and I don't know what everybody else's response would be, but my, my response most often is, the will's the simple part. That's <laughs> it. You don't need a will. You need powers of attorney because really the expense associated with pe what people think um, of a will and how much it costs to go through probate and get their assets if they were to pass away to their beneficiaries, not as significant as if they're in a car accident and injured and now can't make their own decisions. I mean, the, the expenses triple when it comes to a guardianship conservatorship of what it takes to, you know, uh, administer the average probate. Just the costs go up a lot. And so uh, powers of attorney and, and other planning techniques just for individuals and somewhat still inclusive, really, of special needs planning as a community, really important that... Uh, those be implemented for the families that support individuals with special needs, but also for the special needs beneficiary as well. Do you have any, anything on this or they've covered it, you uh, feel like? No, I, I just agree. You know, yeah. the, the earliest, the best, because okay. you don't know what's going to happen right. in your life. So, Let, Let's maybe a scenario real quick. Let's say that, you know, a parent goes to the doctor and the doctor starts the diagnosis of you've got early onset dementia or you've got Alzheimer's or, or, or you name it unfortunately at that point and then you re realize maybe they haven't done any planning they haven't done it you know like I'm sure you guys see this scenario unfortunately a lot like what's the first thing you tell a family to do or, or you know for hopefully they're calling you guys first I would imagine like to start the process but what's the first housekeeping item that they should start to look at is um, from that perspective it's the same thing just getting their affairs in order and you know having that discussion with the family member just because they were diagnosed with dementia or early Alzheimer's does not mean they do not have the capacity to sign powers of attorney um, I think people assume automatically that that that's what it means um, <clears throat> obviously you don't want to be putting documents in front of someone who doesn't know what they're signing <laughs> But I think any good estate planning or elder law attorney is going to do some kind of 
mini mental exam on that person, just basic things, you know, to find out if this person really understands. Um, with powers of attorney, you just need to understand, you know, who your agent is um, and what kind of powers you're actually giving them. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of different um, capacity levels for powers of attorney, for, for wills and for trusts and things like that. Um, but it's important to go to an attorney to do those things. Um, I think, you know, also starting to figure out where all your assets are and making a list and putting it all together in a notebook. You know, <clears throat> here are the accounts, here are the account numbers, here are the passwords for online. That is sometimes the most difficult thing. You know, a lot of baby boomers, there's usually one, um, one spouse that's actually taking care of all the finances and the other has no idea. So if there's, you know, a sudden death, usually it's the woman who's unfortunately like completely clueless as to where the assets are, what, what, um, you know, how to gain access or do anything like that. So I always recommend when I, and when I do any kind of um, estate planning that we have documents basically tabs at the end of the notebook, you know, so you can write down all of your account numbers. And I think that's, you know, really important. And, and talking to the children about, listen, I'm designating you as the agent under power of attorney, and these are my wishes. You need to have that conversation with whomever you're going to designate as your agent. You can't just name people and think that they're going to follow your wishes. You really need to name the person who's going to be, I think, strong, <laughs> and especially when it comes to your health care, that if you are, you know, on a feeding tube or something like that, it, is this what you want or do you want life support removed? Um, you know, living wills are included usually in most attorneys' health care powers of attorney and it goes to all of that. You know, how long do you want to be on life support if you even want to be on life support at all? So I think sitting down with your family is probably step number one and then step number two is let's go meet with someone and, and get these documents drafted. And I think the only Thing that I would add a little bit to it just because of the hypothetical and I think uh, Yvette really mm -hmm. touched upon it which is that meeting to the family is uh, is really setting them up and trying to illuminate as much of what's coming uh, in front of them and not necessarily answering the questions but posing them because uh, especially with many family members you know they haven't been if they didn't do it with their parents right if if uh, if this husband and wife uh, from the example that you gave Phil if they hadn't taken care of their parents and gone through it Then this is their first time down this road and it's certainly probably the first time for their kids to go down so as a practitioner in this area when you uh, You know visit with them. There's a lot of things that I'm sure Yvette and I would sit and say Okay, you guys need to think about these things. It's not just the planning pieces of the documents But let's talk about how is care going to go? Because unfortunately, at this stage of the game, if it's something like Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that, there's no cure, there's no pill that's going to make it go away, and we know that it's a progressive di disease. So um, how, how is the community, how are the kids, how are the family going to provide for care on an ongoing basis? And really, having those discussions is imperative. And uh, what Yvette says is right on in the sense that expressing those to the family as a whole, because I can't tell you the number of times where everybody puts the time into planning for dad, who is the sick, so to speak, spouse or parent in all this, but yet it's the healthy spouse that passes first, mm -hmm. right? It's the healthy spouse that is worried, taken care of, I mean, expended all their energy in, uh, to take care of the unhealthy spouse, and they pass first. And here, the kids are unprepared because the plan always was, mom will take care of dad, dad will pass away, then we'll figure out how to take care of mom, and that's not how it goes. So, having these meetings, making sure that you're empowering the family and encouraging the kids to be involved, and resist some of that notion of, you know, mom and dad are, they don't like to share a whole lot of their business. That's, I can tell you some of the most interesting oh, yeah. meetings where you're, <laughs> you're pushing through those barriers, you know, those meetings where mom and dad come in and you're asking about finances and they don't want the kids to be in there because they don't want the kids to know how much they have. It, it, there's no time for modesty now, you know, everybody needs to hear what the plan is. And uh, that's, that's the important piece and that's exactly what Yvette touched upon. From you guys' perspective, thank you. Um, you know, the plan's in place now, and, and you guys are now dealing with those 
the plan and, and, and helping getting them administered and, and somebody calling in and, and wanting to know what's going on or how does this go or what do we do what, what's the best thing you can tell them when they're calling in to get that advice well I, I just want to add a little bit to Mike's comment uh, a step beyond that in that planning stage is when we often become involved is when you have to think of that once mom and dad are no longer to um, manage their finances or pass away do you have a child that has special needs or isn't able to manage their money effectively and all of a sudden they're receiving a large estate um, settlement that we typically become involved because we're helping them make sure their those funds last throughout their lifetime so that's a, a big part of when we get the call you know you're named as a trustee you know mom and dad have passed away uh, you know it, it's just a, in in my perspective it's it's just setting the expectations and and getting the family members to realize their beneficiaries that you know this isn't a windfall that the funds are typically there to perhaps last their lifetime and what type of plan do we have to have to, to ensure that happens so you know they're not out buying the Ferrari the first day they get their funds. <laughs> well, one of the things I like is when the estate planning attorney sends their client to me or our firm before the estate plan is finalized, which is, doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, I really appreciate that because I can explain to the people who are making their plan how it works from our end because the plan is one thing and then carrying it out is totally different. And we, we have a different perspective because we have to get the benefits and retitle accounts and you know get the person, you know get pe banks to accept the power of attorney when we're the, the agent. Um, and, and so we explain it from our perspective and sometimes I've even called their attorney and said, hey, uh, <laughs> there's some clauses in here that may be better if you change the wording around a little bit. So we kind of work together sometimes to, to come up with a plan that's practical. Because you know the question is, okay, let's say we're their agent and they get in a car accident and they're in another state. All right, how are the people who are treating them going to know who Childersburg is or, or any fiduciary for that matter? So how are they going to know? Then what? What's next? And I kind of talk it through, and they're they're like, wow, we've never even thought about all of this. So there's a lot of practical considerations that can be made, can be addressed in the estate planning process, and even if they're not part of the plan, you know, the written plan. At least the people uh, who make the plan can then talk to their family and say, "Here's what we've set up. Children's and Burgess is private firm, or or Debbie's firm. Or, you know, here's who these folks are, and here's the role they're going to play in case this happens. So it's not only just developing a written plan and putting it in the shelf somewhere and, mm -hmm. and crossing your fingers that you know you never have to about worry it. about it again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I, I kind of talk them through, and a lot of fiduciaries, I think, and attorneys will consult with them at no cost, usually, uh, as to what they can do, what can, they, what can they expect from us. You know, it's a good for them to see us face to face. Can we trust them? Mm -hmm. I always tell people, if you can't trust your fiduciary, then don't name them in your estate plan, because <laughs> it's such an important role. Uh, it requires that kind of a trust. So that part, that element of having various professionals, not just the estate planning attorney, but others get involved in the whole process is very helpful. It helps to know the grantor's intent, too. It, it helps us to do our job mm -hmm. if we know what their intent was and, and what they wanted to see happen with the trust. I think uh, um, it's really important. We didn't uh, touch on it a terrible a lot, but selection of the trustee or fiduciary really is one of the most important uh, uh, aspects of a well-crafted estate plan and uh, that's uh, really important for families to take some time and think about. I, um, we're getting the cue here so um, I want to thank everybody on the panel tonight for taking time out of your days to, to join us and um, please if anybody has any questions listening out there uh, Central Arizona Estate Planning Council our role is to help provide information and value to our not only the listeners but the community in of Maricopa County so please Feel free to reach out to our website or go to our website to get information from any of these panel members, uh, caepc.org. Uh, thank you again, and everybody have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.